Like Psalm 3, this one too is thought to be written when David was fleeing from his son Absalom. Some suggest that the, the two psalms are actually two parts of the same song. And in Psalm 3 the focus was on David's safety. Here it's on his reputation. Here he speaks directly to his slanderous uh, enemies. The title of this psalm um, is to the choir master with stringed instruments, a psalm of David. And I said before, these titles are um, part of the original Hebrew text, so it's important that we, we include them. And um, so it says to the choir master, Lam Natseach in Hebrew. Ma Natseach was the Levite who directed the orchestra in the temple. Now, in David's days, there was no temple, obviously, um, but there was the tabernacle, and there were choirs, or musicians, and we know that, actually, from Scripture. Um, for example, in 1 Chronicles 16, verse 5 through 7, it says, Asaph, the chief, and the next to him, Zechariah, Yael, and uh, Sem Semiramoth, and Jehiel, and Matitia, and Eliab, and Benaiah, and Obededom, and Jehiel, with psalteries and with harps. But Asaph made a sound with cymbals, and Benaiah also, and Yahaziel, the priest, with trumpets continually before the Ark of the Covenant of God. Then on that day David delivered first this psalm to thank the Lord into the hand of Asaph and his brethren. So we read about the musicians and we read also how David, who had written psalm, eh, as I said before, he was a songwriter of sorts, uh, he delivered it to them so that they could play and sing it. And then in 1 Chronicles 25, verse 6, it says, All these were under the hands of their father for song in the house of the Lord, with cymbals, psalteries, and harps for the service of the house of God, according to the king's order to Asaph. Yedutun and Heman. Music was part of the services, and sacrifices were always accompanied by music. Now the title here it tells us that the song was deliberately written for stringed instruments. And it shows again that David was not only deep into the words, which are are enough by themselves, but he was also thinking about the music, how it, it had to sound, which instruments had to be used. You could say he was a composer also, and maybe an, an arranger. Um, now the word manatseach, that is usually translated with choir master or director, comes from the root netzach, which means strength or victory. Lamnatseach could therefore also be translated as to him who causes victory. In other words, God. So some suggest that the title should be to the Lord. So when we look at the, um, the, sch the schematic, the diagram of this psalm, we see that um, uh, David talks to God in verse 1 and then in verse 6, 7, and 8, that is the actual prayer to God. But it is interrupted um, by David talking to his enemies. That's verse 2, 3, 4, and 5. So that's in between. It's sort of giving the background of why he's having this prayer. So, verse 1 is the opening. There it reads, Hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness. Thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. So it's not only a song, it's also a prayer. And he says, hear me when I call. He was not just talking or thinking a prayer in his mind. He was crying out 
with passion. And he didn't just want to throw words towards heaven. He wanted God to hear. He needed God to hear. He needed God's attention for this problem. Power in prayer is often missing because passion is missing. It's not that we convince or impress God with emotions and with uh, loud words or things like that. But God wants us to genuinely care about the things that He cares about. If we pray and we actually don't care about what we are saying, why would we expect God to care about them? Now, he does nonetheless, by the way, but you, you understand the difference. David was stirring himself up to take hold of God. And this is what's necessary. And Isaiah declares this in um, Isaiah 64, f- verse 7. Actually, he speaks about the, the failing of this. And he says, And there is none that calleth upon thy name, that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. No one is taking hold of the Lord. That is a big problem. And when we pray, we should. Now, although David speaks of my righteousness, he knows also it's from God, and it's not from himself. God is the God of his righteousness. No one is righteous before God, before he dresses him in a robe of righteousness. And he does so through Jesus. And we read this, for example, in um, Revelation 19. I think it's verse 8, where it speaks about the bride has made herself ready. She is dressed in a robe of white fine linen, because white is the color of the righteousness of the saints. So, yes, my righteousness, but righteousness, but he speaks to the God of his righteousness. And then David does something that he does in many psalms. He uses past mercies for future help. And of course, we don't need to remind God of what he has done, but it is good to acknowledge and to be grateful of his past work, to, to show, Lord, you have done this for me before. Please do it again. When I was in distress, uh, you have enlarged me. Then he asks for mercy. Actually, the word used is gen, which is grace or favor. And the difference is that mercy is not getting what you deserve, whereas grace is getting what you don't deserve. It's, it's slightly different, different although it's often um, mixed up. In other words, David asks whether God can do him a favor, although he doesn't deserve it. The psalm now makes a turn. Uh, I said it before. Verse 1 is the opening of the prayer, and it continues in verse 6. But in between, uh, David speaks to his enemies. And uh, it's like he wants to give us a background of the reason for this prayer. So in verse 2, it says, O ye sons of men, how long will you turn my glory into shame? How long will you love vanity and seek after leasing? Selah. He addresses them as sons of men, b'nei ish, b'nei ish. Now, he uses the word ish for men. He could also have used the word adam, b'nei adam. But he says b'nei ish. Ish is a word that refers more to men of distinction, honorable men. Uh, Men that would normally honor their own father. Yet... They help Absalom to disrespect and dishonor his own father. And David asks, how long? You can't keep doing this, so you better stop now. Change your ways and be blessed. It's a valid question to ask, how long to play around with sin, uh, since you know uh, how it's going to end anyway. It's only love for vanity, for emptiness. So we see clearly here, as compared to Psalm 3, that the problem is not David's safety. It's not that, but it is his reputation, his glory, which is in God, as we read in Psalm 3, verse 3. My glory and the lifter of my head. 
This is what wicked men do. Through slander and lies they turn anything glorious to shame. How long are you going to continue? He asks them. It's a rhetorical question. He continues then in verse 3. But know that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. David informs his enemies that their conspiracy against him is actually rebellion against God. Against God himself. And they are walking on very thin ice. David knew that he and the other godly people were set apart to God. This is an interesting uh, phrase that he uses this here. The Lord has set apart him that is godly. Why does God set apart his people? Well, for several reasons. For his pleasure. For greater purity. And for special service. And if you think of that, it should beg the question... Am I really set apart? And if so, for what? To do what? Uh, And you can think of these three things that I just mentioned, or maybe even other uh, things. But we should be able to ask, to answer this question in one way or the other. David is exposing the foolishness of his enemies, and he tells them, Don't you know that I'm talking to my God? Not only that, he hears me when I call unto him. In other words, great disaster is waiting for the ungodly. David is assured that God hears his prayer. He doesn't um, doubt it for a second, actually. He says, the Lord will hear when I call unto him. Although in verse 1 he says, hear me when I call. But here he says, the Lord will hear me. He knows it so. And of course we have also this assurance, the Lord hears our prayers. That doesn't mean that we should not ask him to hear our prayers and plea for our cause. And we should have the same assurance that he hears. And if we do not have this assurance, or if our prayers seem to be ineffective... There is a reason for that, usually. There can be many reasons, and um, sometimes we simply ask the wrong things uh, in our uh, ignorance. But um, there are also other reasons, and Scripture gives us actually quite a few possible reasons why prayer uh, is ineffective or unanswered. Um, And I I will list uh, a few Um, and mention also the verse where you can find it. We're not going to read all these verses, but you can uh, write them down if you want and look it up yourself afterwards. So one uh, of the reasons for ineffective prayer is not abiding in Jesus. That's what we can read in John 15, verse 7. Another reason is unbelief. Matthew 17, verse 20 and 21. And another reason is a failure to fast. Matthew 17, verse 21. Now this does not only pertain to to fasting as abstaining from foods, but this can be uh, all kinds of of sacrifice that you bring, dedication, eh? devotion that you bring to the Lord. Um, So failure of that can be a cause of ineffective prayer. Another reason that you may not think of so quickly is a bad marriage relationship. Uh, Peter addresses that in 1 Peter 3 verse 7. And then we have, of course, unconfessed sin. James 5 verse 16. Lying and deceitfulness. Psalm 17 verse 1. A lack of Bible reading and of receiving teaching. Proverbs 28, verse 9. And the last one I want to mention is trusting in the length of form of the prayer. Matthew 6, verse 7. So many pray a a pre-programmed prayer, or maybe even from a prayer book or something, and they trust that 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 format is is good. Uh, Their heart is not in it. It's it's actually just um, reading out something that someone else... Uh, has written. So despite David's troubled past and his sins, uh, 
He knew that God would hear his prayer. He had set things right with the Lord, and his relationship with him was secure. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. And so he continues, still addressing his enemies in verse 4, Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Selah. Stand in awe, or rather, tremble. Tremble in fear of the Lord. Don't sin. It's God whom you are up to. Your position should be one of reverence and awe instead. Meditate on God's word. Fill your mind with God's word. He continues then in verse 5. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. Offering sacrifices means acknowledge your sins and repent from them. And understand who you sinned against. It also means to acknowledge the greatness of God. They should not be just mechanical or mechanically performed sacrifices. They must be righteous sacrifices, it says. David's enemies should trust the Lord and not the evil schemes of men. In this case, Absalom and his rebellion. Now, these are very valuable advices that he gives to his enemies. And then in verse 6, the prayer continues. As I said before, if, if you read verse 1 and then 6, 7, 8, you have the prayer. It's basically four verses. These other four verses come in between. So here he continues speaking to God. Verse 6, there be many that say, who will show us any good? Lord, lift thou up the light of thy countenance upon us. Like in uh, Psalm 3, verse 2, David repeats what his uh, enemies cynically say, that there uh, be no one to do good to David, not even God. But David still believes that God will shine the light of his countenance upon him and on those who are with him. He repeats and he pleads for the blessing that God gave uh, Aaron once uh, to speak. Uh, uh, probably you thought of this already by reading um, this verse here in Psalm 4. So uh, this blessing we can find in Numbers chapter 6, and I want to read verse 25 and 26, where it says, The Lord make his face shine upon thee, and be gracious upon thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee, and give thee peace. He continues then in verse 7, Thou hast put gladness in my heart more than in the time that their corn and their wine increased. As David prays, God is already answering. Now the situation has not changed. David is still threatened by ungodly men all around. But God has put gladness in his heart. And therefore David knows his, answer is, his prayer is already answered. Uh, this in contrast to the ungodly, they can only be happy when they prosper. Yeah, when their corn and their wine is increased, as we just read. But David could be happy even in distressing times, in the midst of misery. Why? Because the Lord has put gladness in his heart. Uh, this, is, um, this answer of prayer happens in the prayer, even while he is praying. And so, I said this also the other time, it's something we should also listen to uh, when we pray. Uh, it's not only a speaking, but God is often answering even in the prayer. And in this case, by giving David a peace and a joy that only he can give. Uh, this uh, goes on in verse 8. I will both lay me down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. God truly blesses David and gives him a peace that only he can give. Indeed, just as David stated in Psalm 3 verse 5, he can sleep in peace. It's one thing to lay down, it's another thing to sleep. If it were not the circumstances, it were not the feelings that controlled David. It was his trust in the Lord 
And thus, regardless of the circumstances, David dwells in safety. Now we too live in a hostile, uh, dark and evil world where the enemy is after us. But if we trust the Lord, he gives us equally peace and he makes us dwell in safety. And he can fill our heart with joy, even in the midst of all of this. He will bless us and he will keep us. He will make his face shine upon us. He will be gracious to us. He will lift his countenance upon us and give us peace. Amen. <laughs>